Go to Sudan now, where, of course, uh, some of the biggest stories on the continent are emerging from. Sudan's military and a powerful paramilitary force have engaged in fierce fighting in the country's capital, Khartoum, and some other places in the country, dealing a new blow to hopes for a transition to democracy and raising fears of a wider conflict. The fighting has led to the deaths of dozens of people and wounded more than a hundred others across the country. The clash erupted on Saturday between army units loyal to General Abdel Fattah al burn head of Sudan's Transitional Governing Council, and uh, the paramilitary rapid support forces RSF, led by General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalu, known as Hemediti, who is deputy head of the council. It was the first such outbreak since both joined forces to oust veteran Islamist autocrat Omar Hassan al-Bashar in 2019, and was sparked by disagreement over the integration of the rapid support forces into the military as a part of a transition towards the civilian rule. The United Nations mission in Sudan said Borhan and Hamed uh, Hamedti agreed uh, to a three-hour ceasefire from 4 p.m. local time uh, on Sunday to allow humanitarian evacuations proposed by the United Nations. But the deal was widely ignored after a brief period of relative calm. As night fell, residents reported the boom of artillery and the roar of warplanes in the Kafuri district of Bari, uh, Bari, which has an RSF base across the Nile River from the capital Khartoum. Uh, of course, you know, you can see on your screen there, really, really sad pictures there uh, from what's going on in Sudan. Of course, a couple of things to know. The part also began in April in 2019, if you remember, it was one of the biggest stories across the continent there where President Omar al-Bashir, who had presided over the country for 30 years, was kicked out of power. Um, it was called the Women's Revolution, I believe. There were some, there were some pictures of uh, ladies Women who, who yeah, were the face of the revolution back then. Um, but of course, Sudan's main opposition coalition the, and the ruling militia, military council, beg your pardon, then formally signed a power-sharing deal in August 2019, paving the way for a transition to a civilian-led government, which has not been successful since then. The arraignment was uh, halted after a failed attempt in 2021, October, to overthrow the country's transitional government blaming military officers and civilians from the former president of uh, a former government of uh, president omar or former president omar al-bashir the failed coup then put the army back in charge but it faced new and renewed isolation deepening economic woes and weekly protests by civilians demanding to gain oversight of the military and see the integration of the powerful rapid support forces into the regular army there have also been allegations of support for the RSF by um, Russia. They, uh, of course, uh, have been said to be trained by the Wagner Group or the Russia's Wagner Group over time, and of course, giving them support also. And that's why I always would mention that uh, some of the crises that you see in different parts of the continent, you know, in front of Africa, what seen on the and surface. exactly in Western Africa and Southern Africa, everywhere, it's, it's all, a lot of times always beyond what we what we think. Sometimes it's really a part also between much bigger powers that we do not, you know, know of. But because there's no you know way to actually verify you know we can only just speculate that okay it might be something you know um you know between the west and you know and china and russia and some of all of that that will only just be you know speculations but most importantly is you know is a prayer for peace and i always mention also that in times when there's a revolution and i don't see any other place that it has been different where there's a revolution a government is kicked out of power the military takes over and things get better it, for, to a large extent, things never really, really, really get better. Right. You know, there's I mean, always one crisis or the other for years and years and years. Absolutely. They've ousted the one who was in power for over 30 years. And then they came together to decide, you know what, we're going to return power to the civilian rule. Unfortunately, RSF is about 100,000 uh, man strong. And they're trying to integrate RSF into the army and to ensure that they form some form of a, you know, a coalition to be able to help an easy transition of government. I said, one would wonder what actually happened because, yes, the head of the army is serving as the leader of the country and the mm -hmm. head of the RSF is serving as the deputy leader. So what is happening, it's obviously showing that there, there is some form of a part or so. There was a video that I stumbled on that was released where one had accused, one of the leaders had accused the other of treason. And, you know, there had been claims and counterclaims. Uh, but my heart does go out to the people of Hartum, the citizens who are the ones that have their lives, who have lost their lives, and who have had their lives put on hold. Um, reports did have it there, about 1,100 people had been affected. And medics, there was a mini ceasefire on Sunday because the medics were complaining that they could not keep up. The hospitals were full, no place to, play, to keep these bodies and to treat these people. 
and at the end of the day it is the the military and you know this paramilitary force that are the ones in charge but unfortunately the citizens are the ones who are suffering for it unfortunately you know it's a really really sad sad um uh, turn of events in Sudan. But of course, uh, we will continue to follow the, of course, like you said, civilians are the ones um, bearing the brunt of some of all of this. And, and, you know, I fear the number of casualties and the fatalities that will emerge I here. Mean, they so may far, not be military forces. We have 1,100, but it could be more. And these same civilians are also calling for the handing over of lucrative military holdings in agriculture, trade, and other industries, a crucial source of power for the army. Now, another point of contention that we must mention by the civilians is the pursuit of justice over allegations of war crimes by the military and its allies in the conflict in Darfur from 20, 2003, I beg your pardon. Justice is also being sought over the killings of at least 125 pro-democracy protesters on June 3, 2019, in which military forces were implicated. So many layers to this conversation, so many angles to this conversation, so many cries and demands. Will these demands be met? What is the impact of the international community? Well, we have all these organizations. When we're talking about, I mean, on the continent, you know, when we're talking about maybe the OAU, mm. uh, African Union and all these organizations, in times like this, my question is, how much influence do these organizations have in being able to quell the storm in some of, you know, the regions of the continent? We've seen beyond what's happening in Sudan. We see what, what, happened, what happened in Ethiopia, right? And uh, there's so many other parts of the continent where we're seeing different tussles here and there. Uh, Burkina Faso, of course, has had yeah. its own fair share. And uh, Mali has had its own fair share. But what is the impact? What power and influence do these organizations have? How much sanctions can they meet out? Are these internal rebels? So, I mean, in some cases, like the M23 rebels, are they afraid of being sanctioned? What can you take away from them that would in some way strip them of the, the need to impose as much terror as they already are imposing? I already, I've, I've said it you know, a million times. You know, the sanctions, I believe, in my, in my opinion, sanctions do not work. They do not work the way that they are meant to work. They are meant to be punitive, you know, against the people who are supposedly causing chaos. But those people in the time that they are in charge and the time that they are um, carrying out the activities that are, you know, that are, that have been sanctioned for, they do not care about the sanctions that are being placed, you know, on them. And so it's the people that eventually get to suffer. There are sanctions that are also placed on countries to frustrate the people enough so that they can revolt against the government. There's different types of sanctions. Um, but in these situations, the African Union and, and um, you know, and, uh, and, and uh, other bodies may not be of very much effect. Even you know, the international think, communities, yeah. with the Pope giving his own one cent, uh, yeah. and the US Secretary of State giving his own two cents. But I, I feel like, you know, there, there would be calls for dialogue. There will be proper calls for dialogue. And I there feel have like been calls, of, but the, the, the leader and the vice leader have both switched off their phone for days. So it's basically, they, will, they, will meet. they are saying they don't want to talk. Yeah, they, they, they will eventually meet. All right, that's uh, the it's, it's prayers up for Sudan, and we hope that there's some dialogue that can bring some peace Absolutely. Uh, to that country in the next few couple of hours or maybe days. Hours, preferably. We'll continue to share updates on that story with you as time passes. Mm -hmm.